Okay, so uh, maybe before we get into the thing, a uh, little introduction uh, to EM fault injection itself. So um, in this work, we will be considering um, pulsed EM fault injection. So there are two types of uh, fold, EM fault injection. One is pulsed. So with pulsed e injection, the, t the name says it's by itself. So you just inject a single pulse into uh, your target IC. Harmonic EM fault injection, on the other hand, um, you inject a continuous wave into your target and you hope that at some point the fault will occur. Um, so the general properties of EM fault injection are that since you have a relatively small coil which you use to produce your EM field, which is targeting your IC, you have relatively good locality. So you can target an area from 100 micrometers up to a couple of millimeters. Um, so so, because you're using electromagnetic wave and they can propagate through the package of an IC, uh, in theory you don't need decapsulation. In practice, it's sometimes e nice to decapsulate mm -hmm. your package because it allows you to uh, put your EM coil or the EM pulse device closer to your actual target, uh, which will increase your resolution. Uh, it has relatively good timing resolution, so you can um, time when you want to inject um, your EM pulse relatively well, so you have nanosecond uh, precision. Uh, if you want to, but this will depend on the actual setup that you're using. Uh, and it can be done cheaply. So if you really want to and you do a little bit of scavenging, you can build one of these setups for 100 euro or less. Um, the downside of using EM pulse injection, so you're emitting an EM field into your IC, it will propagate through all the metal layers and the bonding wires and your PCB. Um, so you don't really have an idea of what exactly you're, you're folding. So you're shooting a certain area, a fault will occur, but you have no... Usually you don't have a clue why. Um, so how does EM pulse injection fault an IC? What's the general faulting mechanism? Which is something that we have to understand before we can actually start building uh, an EM fault injection setup. So you're emitting a magnetic or an E-field or a combination of both into your IC and this will cause fluctuations uh, on all the metal wiring that can be found into your IC. This will cause so current and voltage fluctuations, and if these voltage and current fluctuations occur during the setup and hold time of your IC, so during the setup and hold time, this is when data gets stored. So when there's a clock catch occurring, you want to store something in a register or somewhere else in memory, um, your data has to be stable during the setup and hold time. If there's a fluctuation in the voltage of your data line, during uh, this period, then a fault might occur and the wrong data might be stored uh, into memory. So if you have a very short window of voltage fluctuations, then it might be that you only fault, for instance, one clock catch, or should this thing shift a little bit to the right, then you would inject a fault here. Well, then, you would it, then voltage fluctuations would occur here, and then no fault would be injected. On the other hand, if you have a larger window of uh, voltage fluctuations, or yeah, a broader time span of voltage fluctuations, then you might, for instance, hit um, two consecutive clock cycles and uh, induce two folds. So depending on how you design your setup, you can have voltage fluctuations that look like this, or like this, or completely different. So the pulse shape of the EM pulse that you inject will have an impact on um, the folds generated in, inside of your device. All right, so then if we have a look at the basic components that make up uh, an EM pulse injection setup. So the basic thing that you need is something to generate an electromagnetic field. And the most common thing to use to generate such a field is a solenoid. And a solenoid is basically an inductor. And then through this inductor, you want to put a lot of current. And a nice thing to store charge and to produce a current is a capacitor. And then you need a switch to discharge this capacitor over your solenoid in order to produce your um, electromagnetic field. So that's the, those are the basic components that you need. And then always when you build one of these circuits, you will have some uh, parasitic or intentional resistance in your, in your loop, in your circuit. And then this thing, your, so your solenoid, will couple with the target IC, so met, with all the metal wiring that can be found in there. So there are two basic mechanisms um, that occur during EM pulse injection and that happen within your EM pulse injection setup. So one is you have this RLC loop and everybody that picked up a first year physics course will recognize this thing. So depending on how you pick these 
component, the capacitor, or your solenoid, so your inductor and your resistor, uh, you will have a different time response. So if you pick a large resistor, for instance, you will have a lot of damping and you will have an underdamped response. If you choose a very small resistor, you will have a, um, harmonic oscillations in your, uh, in your response. A second mechanism is then, so when you create your, um, your magnetic pulse, is that it will have to couple with your IC, and in your IC, the two metal structures that you can find are the metal layers um, of your IC itself, and then you also have bonding wires. So we'll couple with either one of the two or with both. Um, that, and this will depend on the probe size that you pick and choose. So, but these two, so the RLC response and your IC coupling, they are closely related, since if you pick a different type of solenoid, if you change the number of windings, if you increase the diameter of your probe, um, your RLC response will change, and also your IC coupling will change. So these two are, um, if you change one, so if you change your probe, you will have an impact of, on your RLC response, which will then also again impact um, the way that your voltage fluctuates within your IC. So it's like a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. So you change your coil, which alters your LC response, which then again alters um, again what's happening inside your IC. So if you want to design a setup uh, for EM pulse injection, we can play with, this cap with the charge capacitance and with this inductor in order to get an optimal response tailored um, to our target IC. But if you want to build an actual setup, so there are a little bit more um, components involved, so you have your simple RLC loop, then you have to add a triggering device to time um, your injection, and then of course you need a power supply. And of most of these components, it's relatively straightforward to which properties that we desire of them. So for instance, for the switching element, ideally we would like an ideal switching element, which means um, very fast rise time, small parasitics on the switching component, consistent timing, so every time your triggering device sends, says, hey, I want to trigger, you don't want there to be a jitter of a couple of nanoseconds. Um, and examples of this component are, for instance, a MOSFET, an IGBT, um, the classic high power uh, switching components. But there's usually a trade-off between the amount of power they can handle and the amount of parasitics <coughs> they have. So the higher the currents they have to be, be capable of dealing with, uh, the more of parasitic capacitance, for instance, that they have. Um, another thing is, so the triggering device itself, that will trigger your switching elements. So as I said before, you need high timing resolution, and you want them to have a small amount of jitter. Then you have your power supply. In general, uh, these power supplies are picked within 100 and 500 volt DC. The reason why there's a limit of 500 volt DC is more or less because that's the maximum where common passive components are rated to. If you want to go higher than 500 volts, these things become very, very <coughs> expensive. Um, so the 500 volts is more a choice of practicality than to be an ideal DC voltage. In general, you want this thing to be as high as possible, or you want to be able to go as high as possible with your DC voltage. Um, and then the last thing we can vary is, of course, our L RLC loop. And this is the only thing that we can actually play with uh, in order to tailor it um, to the IC that we're targeting. So in the next slides, we'll have a look at how to pick and choose these different components and what's uh, the difference in the responses. So in order to do that, uh, we build a small test circuit. So this, is, um, this mimics a simple RLC loop. And for a switching element, so this guy, we use a gas discharge tube. And that's exactly the same thing you will find in your car um, if it isn't a diesel. Um, so this is basically a spark plug. And the reason we chose it is because it mimics the uh, ideal behavior of a switch very closely. So it's capable of handling very high currents, it's very high rise time. The only downside of it is that it isn't triggerable. So what we do is we charge up the small capacitor, which is uh, taken to be 74 picofarad, uh, with a 400 volt DC power supply. And once you hit the 370 volt breakdown voltage, breakdown will occur and you will emit an EM pulse. So this thing will emit, uh, will emit a, constantly, uh, a constant stream, stream of EM pulses, yes. Um, so here we have our actual solenoid, so our injection coil. This is a two millimeter ferrite core uh, with two windings around it. And then in order to measure 
the actual EM pulse that's emitted by the, this thing, we use a 50 ohm microsettip line. And for those who don't know what a 50 ohm microsettip line looks like, it looks like this. So you basically take a standard PCB substrate. Um, in the bottom, you leave <laughs> a ground plane that's as big as possible. And on top of it, you make a single PCB trace. And this acts as an antenna. So this actually mimics an, an ideal uh, waveguide relatively well. And the nice thing about it is that by controlling the width, you can control the impedance. So it's very uh, easy to make a 50 ohm uh, microstrip line, which then uh, matches perfectly with your measuring equipment, such as your oscilloscope. So on one side, it's terminated by 50 ohm with your oscilloscope. And on the other side here, there should also be a 50 ohm termination um, in order to avoid reflections of the in uh, injected EM pulses. Uh, in our setup, the signal generator also isn't there. So it's just a power supply and um, this little circuit that's positioned above the microstrip line and then stepped in the X direction over this microstrip line. And if you step, um, so your EM injection circuit in the X direction over your microstrip line, you'll get a, a response that looks like this. So here you have your microstrip line. If your injection probe is situated exactly above your microstrip line, the measured field will be zero. And then the further away you step from uh, your microstrip line, at some point you will get a maximum response, and then it will die out again. Um, so, and the distance from here to where you have your maximal response is what we call the resolution of your probe. And um, the maximal amplitude is the maximal amplitude. And every time we give a time response uh, of one of our probes, it will be given at the point at this point. Okay, so we mimic the basic LLC circuit and the thing, the properties that we vary are uh, the capacitance, um, the inductance by varying the diameter of the ferrite core, the number of windings, uh, and the ferrite type, and the winding geometry. Uh, the resistance is always just taken as the parasitic resistances in the, in the circuit. Um, so and the first thing we vary is the charge capacitor. So um, you can see increasing the charge capacitor will increase your maximal amplitude and the width of your pulse. Then if we vary the core diameter, um, here we only take so the position instead of the time uh, information. So you see increasing the diameter will decrease your resolution. So if you take a small diameter probe of one millimeter, you'll have a better resolution or a smaller resolution than if you take a four millimeter probe it will become larger your resolution. So your peaks will decrease a little bit in size and spread out over the distance. And then if you increase the number of windings, um, so the smaller the amount of windings, the smaller your pulse width will be and the higher your pulse uh, peak amplitude. And for the ferrite material, so here also the ferrite material will have a big impact on the, the magnetic field that's produced by your EM pulse device. So taking a different ferrite material might double or half um, the size of your pulse, so the size of your magnetic field. And then varying the winding geometry. So commonly what's done is the solenoid windings are placed one on top of each other. Um, so that's what we mean with winding stacked. Then you get a smaller pulse than when you would horizontally overlap the different windings. Um, so and surprise, surprise, all of these things, if you would just simulate this in spice, then it would match perfectly. So the circuit matches basic physics. Um, that's kind of what we showed here. So in order to show that playing with these different pulse shapes and changing the winding geometry that it might have an impact on an actual fold injection campaign, uh, we made a little experimental validation of that. So um, we took an ARM M4, uh, so the SCM32 F411 we ran it at 100 megahertz and without encapsulated it we ran um, some code in it that just stored uh, the first 10 registers back into memory. And for every uh, fold injection, we stored uh, this. So it is a 32-bit architecture. So we just stored this data back into memory. And then we checked afterwards whether or not it was written correctly. All right, so therefore, we adjusted the simple RLC circuit a little bit to an actual um, EM pulse circuit. So, but you can still easily recognize the structure. So here is your charge capacitor your injection coil and your switching device and everything else is just added around it. This is the power supply. 
of which the current is limited by a small, well, a big resistor. And then at the bottom, so we have our MOSFET switching device. This will switch and discharge all the charges of the C1 capacitor through this L1, the solenoid induction core. In order to limit the core and to make uh, the, the current flowing through it, we have a limiting resistor R2 that's there a little bit for safety. So this one is chosen such that the current can never exceed the maximum 45 amperes that can run through M1. And then on the other end, we have R3, which is uh, there for damping um, purposes. So if we choose R3 to be 10 ohm, for instance, this is underdamped or, or close to critically damped. If we decrease this one, uh, we end up with an um, underdamped circuit, so there will be uh, harmonic oscillations. The, the MOSFET itself is driven by a, a MOSFET driver and then a signal generator. All right, so this is the circuit that we used. We place it on top of the STM32, and then if we take a critically drained probe, we can see that we can nicely target individual writes to memory. So we can, for instance, when we write R0 back, if we shoot during the first 10 nanoseconds, we can just target that write back. If we underdamp our probe, then um, you can see that this already becomes a little bit broader. We also start targeting different registers, and at some point there's an overlap where we hit both uh, two consecutive writes back to memory instead of only a single one. So just changing your damping from being critically damped to being slightly underdamped might have a significant impact on um, your fold injection campaign. All right, so to conclude, so we illustrate the impact of different components uh, on your pulse shape. We built an em positive full injection circuit based on those findings, and then in the end, uh, we demonstrated that may having a different pulse shape actually might have an impact or a significant impact on your full injection campaign. All right, thanks for your attention. Are there any questions?